Coming up on The Civil Discourse, preventive medicine specialist, health journalist, and co-author of the book, How to Eat, Dr. David L. Katz discusses healthy lifestyle choices in the face of the COVID-19 global pandemic and social determinants, including race and class. Chronic disease comes at us in slow motion. It doesn't activate the fight or flight response. COVID activates the fight or flight response. Everybody's acutely anxious. So this pandemic has essentially put a spotlight on the pandemic that was here all along. Terrible diet, poor lifestyle, chronic disease, and made it an acute concern. Okay, what can I do? And the answer is you can do a lot. Welcome to the Civil Discourse. I'm Paula Morantz Cohn, Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University, speaking to you during the COVID-19 global pandemic from my apartment in Center City, Philadelphia. Today, my guest is Dr. David L. Katz, preventative medicine specialist, founding director of the Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center, and past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Dr. Katz, welcome to the Civil Discourse. Great to be with you, Paula, thank you. Well, you look at the current pandemic from a more holistic perspective than is generally done, and you talk about health and the immune system. Is it your position that good health, eating and exercising well will make it less likely that one will get sick or very sick from the virus? For sure, the value proposition of lifestyle as medicine eating optimally, being active, avoiding toxins, getting enough sleep, managing stress is off the charts. You know, I mean, massive, massive reductions in heart disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, stroke, dementia, all the bad stuff. 80% of all chronic disease could be eliminated by using lifestyle as medicine. And, and frankly, we've looked at the distribution of the major cardiometabolic risk factors for bad COVID outcomes. And that'd be type two diabetes, obesity, hypertension, coronary disease, dyslipidemia, and so on. And almost 60% of the population in the US has at least one of those. And almost 50% has two or more of those. And they massively change the likelihood of a, of a bad outcome. There are really two things that meaningfully influence the likelihood of a, a bad outcome. So if you get this infection, are you going to be hospitalized? Are you going to wind up in the ICU? Are you at risk of dying? And the, the major shifts are seen with age. Can't do anything about that. So older people are at higher risk, in particular over 70. And in particular, there's another bump at 80. Uh, but the other is the presence or absence of these major chronic disease states and they're massively influential. Um, we have evidence from at least two lines of research. One I've participated in directly, it's called endothelial function testing, where we look at vascular reactivity, and the other I have not. It's laboratory research looking at something called chemotaxis, basically you know, the responses of, of cells and cell culture to provocation and how, how immune cells react. But both of those suggest that you can alter your physiologic responses, your metabolism, with a single meal, with a single walk. But the, you know, the sort of the, the summation here is that all of the stuff we can do to improve our health over time can absolutely make a meaningful difference at this time in terms of the, the outcomes associated with this infection. Okay. Um, do you feel then, given that we have, well, we have many people who are not healthy, some who can become healthy, and some who are healthy, that we the re uh, response to the pandemic was not appropriate. I mean, that shutting down the country the way we did uh, was not a good idea, given that there are people for whom the risk would have been less. And then, of course, the issues, the economic issues and other related issues would not have been as dire. Well, it, it's easy to say, Paula, that 
the response of our country wasn't terrific because the response of our country wasn't at all cogent. You know, one day it was a hoax and the next day we were at war. So, you know, if grownups had been in charge, uh, we would have been in much better shape because we would have anticipated based on data coming out of China, South Korea, we would have had a plan, we would have prepared. What we did was extremely haphazard. So you could argue, yes, that we shut down way too much. But you could also argue that we shut down way too late. If we were going to shut down to flatten the curve and keep everybody safe, we should have done it before the virus was already widespread. And we should have thought carefully about sending college students home because you know we did already have information to suggest young, generally healthy people seem to have a very ma- mild bout of this. So what then was the risk that a lot of them had asymptomatic infection, we were sending them home to their parents or maybe even grandparents, where the risks of bad outcomes would be massively amplified. Not to mention those populations were concentrated on college campuses. We sent them to every corner of the country. So you're saying a strategic response. So it, it, and obviously we didn't have that. We obviously did not have that. And, and so even if you feel, and, and yet you're making the point that, that I've shared that we needed to look at all potential harms, the harms of infection and the harms of mass unemployment and and ravaging the social determinants of health. And we should have chosen policies based on the minimization of the sum of the two, because any way people get hurt or lives are lost, bad. And any way we protect people and save lives, good. And, And that, so total harm minimization was my goal from the start. And then you can have a lot of debate about what's the best way to do that. And, and nobody you know, owns a monopoly on the answer. So I would have been happy to participate in those discussions, but I don't claim to be the one person who knows. Maybe we did need an initial phase of shut everything down. Maybe we did. The, the approach was because of an ID specialist, an infectious disease doctor, whereas you could have had a whole array of people if we had real leadership here who would have together come up with a plan. But with that, minus that, obviously the doctor who knows the disease drives the policy. I I wrote a piece that ran in the New York Times quite early in all of this, talking about total harm minimization. One of the many outcomes of that, and many of them were lovely, but one of them was that some of my uh, former Yale colleagues pounced on me to say, he's wrong. And in addition to their letter in the New York Times, which was fine, there was a certain amount of uh, assault and abuse in social media with the implication that I was unqualified to opine because I was not an infectious disease epidemiology specialist. Now, to be clear, I'm board certified in preventive medicine, public health, trained in epidemiology, have authored an epidemiology textbook, five editions, taught epidemiology to Yale medical students for well over a decade, and on and on it goes, I'm qualified. But I I readily agree. Am I the world's leading expert in infectious disease? No. A virologist? No. A microbiologist? No. But here's the problem. The people who are the leading experts in that know next to nothing about social determinants of health and, and how ravaging the economy will translate into a whole host of really bad stuff. Inequities, poverty, destitution, desperation, food insecurity, child abuse, depression, suicide. But somebody who's focused on the big picture of public health absolutely sees that too. So we needed infectious disease experts and chronic disease experts and sociologists and anthropologists and psychologists and economists and on and on it goes. I couldn't I couldn't right decision. agree more with that assessment. And you know, in light of the protests that have happened the uh, African-American population has been inordinately affected by this. Um, it, It just supports your view. I'd like you to talk a little bit about what a healthy, what, what constitutes a healthy lifestyle in your opinion? Um, What is, what is it that we can do, whoever we are, to be healthy? Well, just to quickly reemphasize the point you just made, Paula, uh, communities of color, are harder hit by COVID for many reasons, uh, some related to economics, but a lot related to sort of social disparities and a higher burden of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, preventable stuff that puts them at higher risk of bad COVID outcomes. They're also at higher risk of bad outcomes from economic collapse. And now we have this issue of the racial discord in the country. So uh, arguably a triple whammy and if ever there was a mandate for 
a, 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 a new civil rights movement, we have it. And that's exceedingly important. And, you know, I, I, I certainly hope and believe that this time is different and we get meaningful reform and we narrow those disparity gaps. And they relate also to the things that we can and should do to improve our overall health. The, the answer is simple. It's just not easy to implement in a culture that runs on Duncan, where multicolored marshmallows are part of a complete breakfast and every kind of labor saving technology is a good thing. And, you know, actually using our legs to get somewhere is considered a chore. But the answer is feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. I, I'm the past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And so I would argue that's the six cylinder engine feet, physical activity, forks, dietary patterns, fingers not to bring cigarettes to our lips and not to bring too much alcohol to our mouths, either avoidance of toxins, sleep, making sure we get enough, stress, making sure we don't have too much, and love or social connections. So if, if you eat optimally or physically active, don't smoke or abuse alcohol, get enough sleep, manage your stress, and you have strong social interactions, a network of, of people support you, you're firing on all six cylinders. And that replicates the pattern you see in the blue zones places where people don't get chronic diseases or get them very, very rarely, routinely live to be 100, prosper with vitality to a ripe old age, and then go gently into that good night uh, often really in their see, sleep. I mean, that's a wonderful outline of what's needed. And you can see how the quarantine, the lockdown has really disturbed some of those elements. It conspired against it. At the very time when you know eating optimally, being active was more important than ever because it actually could do something directly related to the risk of COVID. Right, everybody's locked in, lonely, depressed, stressed out, and worried, and saying, where are the potato chips? Junk food and eating junk food, right? <laughs> yes. You know, lifestyle, even the word, is a word associated with the affluent. And so there is this disparity, as there is so much disparity in this country between the haves and the have-nots. How do we get these ideas to filter to people who have less? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you in leveraging the incredible power, the incredible advantages of lifestyle as medicine is simple, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And it's harder as you confront more and more disparities. And, and the simple reality, I'm someone who's written... 18 books so far, most of them about lifestyle and its power. But I recognize that the people that I most want to help are least likely to buy a book about lifestyle, and, you know, least likely to access any website where I'm sharing my opinion, least likely to use any app I'm involved with. And that's always the challenge in public health. The people who most need our help have least access to it. So ultimately, we need this to reverberate at the level of culture. Now, this is a little bit awkward to say because I'm a left-leaning public health physician and I really don't believe in trickle-down economics, but I do believe a bit in trickle-down lifestyle medicine. And, and what I mean by that, Paul, is if, if, you know, first of all, I think we should be doing lots of things directed to the people who face disparities, enhancing the SNAP program, uh, incentivizing the identification and selection of nutritious food. Uh, making resources freely available. I think a lot of this should be directed through the federal government. There, there's never been a better time for a national Let's Get Healthy Together campaign because it will protect us from COVID, the next pandemic, and be good for us anyway. And so, you know, I think there's all sorts of things that we, we could and should be doing. But the simple reality is that we can most readily pe reach people who are going to watch this, for example. So what do we do with the people who will hear this conversation? Well, we all need to vote at the cash register, we need to renounce junk as a food group. Because you know, if enough of the middle class says, I no longer accept that junk is food or, or food can be junk, I, I won't buy it. I only buy real food. Well, then the, the profit incentive for mass producing junk food starts to go away and those companies start to change their practices. Does that then trickle down and influence what stocks the shelves of bodegas? Yeah, it's not like you know we're, we're gonna we're going to create an inventory of bad food just for the the people who can't afford good food. No, essentially it's the spillover effect of a country that is okay with glow in the dark. Okay, I food. understand. Uh, the problem is, and I speak from personal experience, that junky food is addictive, and to eat well, you have to cultivate a taste for healthy food. 
Um, and sugar and salt are just so appealing to the palate. How does one, I mean, it takes time, like so many things. You know, exercise too is a habit. Right. And the issue of habit and discipline is so central to preventative medicine. And if you're in a chaotic lifestyle, it's very hard to have that Agreed. discipline. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely. I coined the term many years ago. I think I was writing for US News and World Report at the time, Taste Bud Rehab. And, uh -huh. and it shows up in, in a number of my books as well. And this idea that you know taste buds are adaptable little fellas. Uh, when they can't be with the foods they love, they learn to love the foods they're with. And, and they learn to love the foods they're with for good or for ill. Absolutely. And, and interestingly, Paul, I've, I've been at meetings, uh, uh, whether I should have been or not, I, it, you know, it's debatable. I think they regretted having me, but some of the big food companies in America invited scientists in to, to talk about consumer trends. And when they invited me, I said, guys, you are responsible for corrupting the American palate. Yeah, people like what you sell, but it's because you sell stuff that gets them used to ever more sugar, ever more salt, ever more chemical flavorants and so forth. And, and yes, we absolutely know that this is designed, literally engineered to be as addictive as possible. And so back to your question, you know, what do we need to fix so that everybody can eat well? Well, this is part of what we need to fix. Do we need a policy layer? Do we need to prohibit the engineering of willfully addictive junk food? Absolutely. So we need to empower individuals we need to give people the option of making good choices, but we need to remember the choices anyone makes always subordinate to the choices all of us have. And if we mostly have bad choices, it doesn't matter how you empower individuals, they're going to make bad ones because their culture basically is bigger than they are. I'm curious to know what you think about a vegetarian or a, and or a vegan diet. Is that something that you promote? Um, do you have thoughts about I that? I do, very strong thoughts. So I, I look at diet through three lenses. Uh, what's optimal for the people eating the diet, and that's both health and pleasure, by the way. You know, we get pleasure from good health. We get pleasure from good food. We should not have to trade one off against the other. So the diet you want and the diet that, that's best for you. I also look, and this is critically important, at the environmental footprint. You know, the signature issue of our time before we had all these other issues uh, was the fate of the planet, which is very much in peril. How we're using water, land, greenhouse gas emissions, critically important. And then how we treat our fellow creatures. Uh, I have a horse. I have dogs who are my best friends in the world. You know, I, I think how we treat all the biodiversity is enormously important. If you look through all three lenses, it's, it's a very powerful argument for everybody to have an overwhelmingly plant-predominant diet. And it makes a pretty strong case for plant-exclusive diet. So that would be whole food, plant-based veganism. That said, there are many beautiful variants on the theme of eating well that move us as a population in the right direction. And I actually run a startup company at this phase of my career called Diet ID. That's all about this, helping people know what their diet is, what it ought to be, and how to get there from here. And we have optimal versions of diets ranging from paleo and low carb all the way to vegan and everything in between, Mediterranean, flexitarian, pescatarian, etc. And I, I think that's the right answer, Paula, because otherwise it's too dogmatic. It's me telling you how you have to eat, and you're probably going to say, hey, talk to the hand. I don't want to hear you. If we allow for the fact that, that optimal eating for people, planet, and all other life is a clear theme, but that there are variants on the theme that let you do it the way that works for you and your family, I think we can win a lot more people over. So do you feel that, um, I don't know whether you're in favor of Medicare for all, but should preventative medicine be folded into the, what, is, what is mandated for all citizens? The, the mechanisms of reimbursement that will work in the American political system are a separate discussion. But do I believe in healthcare access for all? Healthcare is a human right? Yeah. And you know what? everybody does, whether, yeah. they, whether they admit it or not. So just picture the scene. You know, there's a shark attack at the beach. The, the, the lifeguards manage to pull somebody out of the water. They're bleeding profusely do, and they're unconscious. Do we need to verify that they can pay before the ambulance comes and takes control? Precise, Clearly not. That's precisely the point. Yes, everybody would agree that the person who's attacked by a shark should get health care. But well, what about the person who's obese or the person who's slightly obese? So, so, so then, so actually colleagues and I some years ago published a model 
we, we looked at basically tiers. So, you know, there's emergency care. It's a human right. Everybody gets it. There's urgent but less emergency care. Everybody gets it, but, you know, maybe there's a, a, a copay. There's highly valued preventive services that are recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. They're a public good. So there's less disease burden in the country, more productivity, lower health care costs. Everybody gets those. And not only does everybody get those, maybe you actually pay people to go. So you actually get a financial incentive to get your colonoscopy. Because you know, if you're having chest pain, you want medical care. If you should have a colonoscopy, you don't really want one. Nobody wants one, right? So you say no copay for emergency care. It's a, it's a human right. An incentive to get the preventive care that is evidence-based. But then you move down to lower tiers where some aspects of healthcare become more and more optional. That's very interesting. So I think that's how it should be put together. What everybody gets is a human right. What everybody should get is a public good. What's important but not quite essential what's a bit less important and what ultimately is unimportant and entirely discretionary. And we mapped that all out and we had sort of a, you know, different financial handling. Yeah, I think that that's makes perfect sense. I do. Thank you. The whole idea of exercise, going to the gym, which is very much part of American culture, particularly among affluent people, as opposed to having exercise somehow uh, integrated into one's life the way Europeans at least used to do. I don't right. know, I think it's more Americanized now. Yeah. Um, I find the idea of going to the gym, there's something wrong with that, in my opinion. And I wonder, and this is just personal, I've never even explored it fully, but I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Personally, I, I love the gym. I've got a home gym. I use the gym, but I agree with you. And, and I think what you're saying is epitomized by a cartoon I saw and, and put in a slide deck some years ago, and it's a group of people standing by a sign that says fitness center one flight up the stairs are right there and they're waiting for the elevator oh, yeah and i you know i think that's the problem that's the mindset the idea that exercise is a burden it's a chore you go to the gym you get it over with it's not it's not just movement it's not just animal vitality it's not just it's normal to use your legs and, 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 and walk places. And so I, I believe in both. I, you know, I think there's a level of fitness that you can achieve with intense physical activity that's easiest in the gym. And it's nice to have a place to work out indoors when the weather's miserable and it's really cold, it's raining, it's snowing, it's icy. Um, but that should not be a reason to preclude motion throughout the day and i think it's really important for people who don't want the gym and you know are allergic to spandex <laughs> motion throughout the day works perfectly well so the the literature is very clear paula that 60 to 70 percent of the fitness benefit you can get in the gym you can get just by being in motion throughout your day but you know just make motion a part of your daily routine and again if that adds up the 30 minutes or more every day, it makes a meaningful difference all on its own. And if you also go to the gym, because you want to, you can, you like it, great. But you know, neither one of those obviates the benefit of the other. Right. And, and yes, you're quite right. There are many different ways to get the benefits of physical activity, and you don't need a gym. Um, on the other hand, there is added benefit from the gym, and many people, myself included, just like that. Well, we, this has been terrific. We're going to be winding up. But I wonder if you could talk to the issue of what can be done right away. Um, is there, you know, to move toward health? Um, I, you know, we tend to think of it as a long process. And I know it is to be truly healthy. But is, is there any benefit that one can have right away or do right away to, to begin to be healthy? There is an immediate benefit. It is never too late to use lifestyle as medicine. I, my, one of my more recent columns was why two pandemics are better than one. And again, as a lifelong devotee of lifestyle medicine, I've long lamented what a hard sell it is because we could help people eliminate literally 80% of the risk of premature death in all major chronic disease. The problem is the reward is deferred. Okay, so 10 years from now, I won't have a heart attack or I won't have diabetes. I'll get to that tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow never comes. Chronic disease comes at us in slow motion. It doesn't activate the fight or flight response. COVID activates the fight or flight response. Everybody's acutely anxious. So this pandemic has essentially put a spotlight on the pandemic that was here all along. 
terrible diet, poor lifestyle, chronic disease, and made it an acute concern. Okay, what can I do? And the answer is you can do a lot. So you can actually begin to alter your hormonal balance, your immune system response, and your vascular health with a meal or a walk. So it's immediate, it's today. And then if you start to incrementally improve those things, the benefits will accrue over a span of days and go from measurable to meaningful. So it's never too late to begin. Some of the benefit absolutely is immediate, but then if you make this a commitment over time to do all you can to eat well, be physically active, avoid toxins, try to get enough sleep, manage your stress and so on, you really can add years to your life and life to your years and defend yourself against acute threats like COVID into the bargain. Well, thank you. That is inspiring. I'm going to have a salad for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'll do the same. I want to thank you, Dr. David Katz, for being here today on The Civil Discourse. I think this has been an illuminating interview. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you, our audience, for joining us today on The Civil Discourse.